that introduction probably leads you to wonder what will I decide to do when I grow up, which is not a bad place to be. And my title this afternoon is We Don't Need No Education, The RAF and the Tyranny of Training. Now, when Roger Waters of Pink Floyd wrote the band's most famous song, Another Brick in the Wall, Part 2, it was, of course, intended to be a protest song. The lyrics contain the memorable lines, we don't need no education, we don't need no... The target of Waters' critique was intellectual conformity, institutional rigidity and individual oppression. He thought that education should have been about freedom, openness and liberty but he found the schools that he attended were actually its enemies. The purpose of education as he experienced it was preparing students for unquestioning acceptance of their place within a vast impersonal machine to dutifully perform the functions arbitrarily allocated to them by impersonal forces that assumed an unassailable authority. Now in the 40 years since the song was released, much has changed, thankfully, about the objectives and outcomes of formalised schooling. The focus has actually shifted from teaching to learning and curriculum to capability. In Australia, certainly, we would say, education has become the chief source of social mobility and economic ascendancy. And there are a few areas of government activity deemed more worthy of substantial investment, I think, than education. This is also true of the ADF, which I'm going to suggest is the largest single provider of education and training in the country, bar none. Notably, the percentage of officers across all three services with a university qualification has increased from less than 2% in 1967 to nearly half in 2017. Across the same period, the percentage of officers with a higher degree has risen from practically nil to approaching 25%. Now, when you think about it, this is a seismic shift in 50 years. And I think it's a change that ought to be welcomed because it has marked, it has influenced the culture of the Defence Force itself and certainly marked its people. Now I this afternoon want to contend that in the Air Force, where the institutional emphasis has consistently been on harnessing technology, there is a clear preference for training which has come at the expense of education, at least in emphasis, and that the confidence in what training delivers in terms of capability does not exist in relation to the benefits of education understood in terms of capacity. Now, the consequences of a greater emphasis on training are largely imperceptible on a daily basis. But it might have led, within the RAAF, to an instrumentalist approach to problems and deprive the Air Force of the richer intellectual culture that I believe, nay, I know, exists in the army. And so for all the things that people say about the army and its rigidities, I would have to say, having been here for three years and worked with all three services, the intellectual culture in the army is more supple and more nuanced than that of the other two services. And I also believe that the RAF does not have an ability to explain its, its remit to those beyond its own members that actually exist within the army. Now, you might say, who cares? The RAF won the procurement battle. But the army is winning the public battle in terms of understanding what the army exists to do and why it's a worthy contribution of public funds. And if it is the case that both the parliament, the press and the people if they are um, excluded from a proper understanding of the possibilities of air power, over time it will actually have an effect. Over time, politicians will not be persuaded as to the efficacy of air power. The press, with a single word called a scare campaign, 
will be able to kill dead, perhaps a capability. And of course, the people who are paying for all of this may not actually be persuaded that it's in their best interest or the best way to apply their money. Now, it's not a case of either or when it comes to education and training. It is both and. And yes, the Air Force does both education and training. Yet the need to harness technology that has so preoccupied the Air Force across the last 60 years, in my judgment, seems to have been at the expense of devising a vision for education as the potential basis for a holistic depiction of air power. It's not sold well, it's not heard well. Now I readily can see that this is a personal perception built on research for a volume covering the 50 year relationship between UNSW and Defence, a book that appears in February next year. And I cannot prove the contention that I'm putting to you in the time available this afternoon. But I can perhaps begin to persuade you to at least consider the notion. And that's all I'm trying to do. Hear this too. It's an observation, not a criticism, because there is much that can be said in terms of mitigation. You can't do everything, therefore you focus on some things. I would also say that I'm making these remarks as someone whose formative years were spent in the Navy. And I would make very similar observations of the RAN. In fact, naval seminars that I've hosted have shown far more, I think, limited thinking and the ability to not talk in acronyms uh, than I've certainly heard here today. I think actually the Navy's doing least well. When, when I was the speechwriter to the chief, the line we used to use was, the best army argument for the Navy was its own history. And for some reason, the Navy did do well in acquisition in the 80s. I think it was part and parcel to things like bicentennial naval salutes and other things like that, venues to say to the people, this is an island, we have more water that's not ice than anyone else in the world, we have 8,233 offshore islands, but go, yeah, yeah, we get it, we get it, we get it. But it's somehow the culture at that time seemed to me to work well for Navy to line up both um, acquisition and the account that was being given publicly and also to the press and politicians about why this investment was necessary. So I'm not singling out the Air Force and saying you're not doing particularly well. It seems to me simply that, and I'm wanting to invite your attention to, an element of air power that is the ability to explain its application to the parliament, the press and the people that is often overlooked and to canvas the interest of anyone who's interested here today in exploring this issue further. It's a matter of continuing interest to me, and I'd like to speak with people who are concerned perhaps about, well, one, that I'm wrong, but secondly, that there is a view within Air Force that education could be done better within a larger vision. Now, let me begin near the beginning of what I consider the early evolution of what I consider a flawed mindset. Now, when ministerial approval was given to establish the RAF College on the 9th of July 1947, the charter was to provide tertiary education and professional training for RAF officers on permanent commissions. The initial offering was a four-year course concentrating on science and mathematics, in addition to RAF subjects and flying training. It appeared that the educational standard of the college's, college's inaugural entry was in fact largely unsatisfactory with many cadets struggling to reach the required proficiency, especially in what? Science. I think this partly, though, reflected the uneven character of secondary school education around the country and the kinds of people that were wanting to join. Not many people were wanting to join in the shadow of World War II. But to its credit, the Air Force didn't consider lowering its standards, but actively raised them to ensure its officers were not considered inferior to those of the Navy or the Army. And so the discussion shifted to achieving the right balance in course content between <coughs> academic education and technical training. Now, in September of 1956, the member of the Air Board responsible for personnel, uh, Air Marshal Frederick Scherger, ordered a review of the college syllabus. His personal objective was to see the four-year course <laughs> reduced to three, with years one and two devoted to academic subjects and the third focusing on flying training and operational acquaintance. The Chief of the Air Staff, though, Air Marshal Sir John McCauley, made clear his own view, and that was this. The ultimate aim should be the attainment of a bachelor's degree in science. Now, the review committee recommended in November of 57 
that general duties cadet should be educated to Bachelor of Science level with Melbourne University, that other place, granting degrees to graduates on condition that Point Cook staff facilities and research programs met its specifications. Let's be clear, Air Force was further advanced than the other two services in linking with universities and putting out there the importance of officers having degrees. This didn't have the same priority in the either of the two services for about another seven years, and only then because of recruiting. If we don't offer them degrees, guess what? They won't join. Air Force was ahead on saying this is a professional standard and the universities can't help us. The rationale of the Chief of Air Staff was plain. He said, in 20 to 30 years' time, when the first graduates of the new scheme will be reaching high rank, the Air Force will probably be primarily a missile service. Its leadership, he thought, should have a very broad and advanced education, but based on a science degree, in order to establish a widely recognised standard which will encourage boys with the high academic aptitude and education which is desirable for us. A broad education, but it will be a science degree and you can only major in physics and maths. Now, with the goodwill of Melbourne University, the RAF College was reconstituted at the beginning of 61 as the RAF Academy and was formally affiliated with Melbourne University. Again, well ahead of Army and Navy, which didn't sign agreements with UNSW until July of 1967. And the affiliation statute explained that, and I quote, the Academy shall be an educational establishment affiliated with the University of Melbourne for the purpose of instruction of candidates for the various degrees of the Faculty of Science and the degree of Doctor of Philosophy of the University. Again, I would say Air Force way ahead of the other two in its doctoral program at Point Cook put the other two in the shade by a long way. At one point there were 22 doctoral students at Point Cook. That is just remarkable. Now, the course for general duties officers, the non-pilot cohort, was four years duration. The first three years were essentially a Bachelor of Science degree with a major in physics. So you can have any colour car you like, so long as it's black. Now, there was no choice in the subjects that were studied. In other words, there's a narrowing of the outlook of the cohort of students, not an opening of their outlook. Now, the first few years of the affiliation were challenging, largely because the combined attrition rate nearly hit 60%. And those cadets who were not failing were coupled by those cadets who said, I actually don't want a degree, I want a diploma. Because I joined the Air Force to fly, not to do this. Now, I remember as a small boy, senior officers saying to me, you know, don't let your education get in the way of your training. And that was the mindset 38 years ago when I joined, that really the education thing was an optional extra, it was nice to have, but you'll never use it in the fleet. That same attitude was, relevant, was apparent, perceptible, at Point Cook in the 1960s. So what do you do? Get rid of the degree? No. What you do is have a vision for education which gets the cadets to see that this is part of personal, professional preparation for a career, for a vocation. But that didn't happen. No, 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 you just tinker around with recruiting, you try to give certain incentives for retention, as apart from saying, we want, need, require an educated officer corps. Now, I could stop at this point, and I'm only at 1961, because my main contention would be substantiated. That is, the purpose of education is not to produce an educated person, but to provide a platform for professional service oriented training. Now, there was no sense then, and sometimes I'm not seeing it in subsequent years, that education was seen as important as a means of acquiring the discipline of critical thought, the broadening of intellectual horizons, the development of cognitive imagination, or the challenging of personal prejudices. Education wasn't seen to do that, it was the basis for which you could go on to do your service type particular training. Now I would say conversely, tell me when, where and how in your time at university you were ever trained to think. 
You weren't, because universities don't do it or don't do it well. What they do is provide a mechanism to measure how well you can think on the day that you arrived, and hopefully by some means, your ability for critical thought might improve in subsequent years, but if it does, it's an accident, not an intention. At our university, UNSW, right now, I've challenged a number of faculties to say to me, tell me, show me, point to me how you actually train people to think. Well, it's actually a bit embarrassing because I don't actually think we do it. It happens incidentally, not intentionally. And therefore, you might say, well, it's not surprising in 1961 that the Air Force was not thinking in terms of actually education is about broadening horizons, critical, all of those kinds of things that I mentioned before. But let me just follow the story a little bit longer to see if the mindset changes. Well, the Minister for Air, and he'd been a former Fleet Air Arm pilot during World War II, so blame the Navy, Peter Howson wrote to the Vice-Chancellor of Melbourne University, Sir David Derham, in 1967, proposing the development of an applied science degree which would more closely meet Air Force needs. A degree that would be even more narrowly focused. Now, there was a lack of consistency in the stated requirements of Air Force for educational attainments of officers until the end of the 1960s when the Martin Committee which was commissioned by Malcolm Fraser to look at the possibility of a tri-service academy, described the academic burdens imposed on RAF Academy cadets by the University of Melbourne as simply unrealistic. A single degree course was being offered, the Bachelor of Science, still only two majors, physics and maths, the attrition rate was high, and cadets, quite frankly, didn't want to do it. The committee went on to explain, and I quote, in our opinion, the RAF Academy illustrates an illust rather provides an illustration of the difficulties which arise from a close association between a university and a service college. A baccalaureate course in science with its emphasis on physics is not wholly suited to meeting the needs of the RAAF, which were unstated. No one actually told them the purpose for which all this activity was intended. Now, Three years later, we're now talking into the 70s, the long-serving academic warden at the uh, academy, Mr Walter Hardy, talked about what he saw as the 51% syndrome. Do I need to explain, elaborate on the 51% syndrome? Again, for me at least in my time, 35 years ago, it was, well, 51%. That's just the right amount of effort. Because there wasn't an affirmation, clearly, from those that I looked to with respect for guidance in terms of what should be my aspirations and my attitude, that actually getting high distinctions really mattered that much. A pass was enough. So there was a concern, a deep concern, not only to about the undergraduate program, but the postgraduate program. The Air Force had no vision for postgraduate study, and yet it had the most number of postgraduates connected to its college, more so than Duntroon at that time. And so there was, of course, the long-standing supposed cultural conflict. And Air Vice Marshal Roy Frost, the Academy's historian, concluded that, and let me quote, the problems of amalgamating the spirit of individual inquiry and intellectual integrity with military discipline and unqualified regard for authority were in evidence throughout the life of the Academy. The conflicts between the objective of education which seeks to simulate discussion in independent thought, on the one hand, and training on the other, which looks to vocational relevance and group orientation, were never satisfactorily resolved from an Air Force point of view. Now, I would actually argue there isn't this tension that he's talking about, but certainly the point that he was trying to make was that education could stand to have a contrary influence on the conduct of training. He also went on to say that given many non-graduates had commanded the RAF and we didn't notice much of a difference, why did we bother anyway? So if you could be, and I'm not thinking about anyone in particular, but if you could be CDF without a degree, then why are we doing all of this? If it's a gold standard that somehow peters out, or if, for instance, we've never validated the importance of um, Air Force education to Air Force senior officers, which we've never done, then this could be an entirely wasteful exercise. All it could be about is window dressing. Making the people think the RAAF is a educated group of people when really they're trained 
but we'd like people to think that we are educated and certainly we'll always hold up in one hand the possibility that it helps recruiting. So Roy Frost is saying all these things about the academy, yet at the same time almost undermining his own conclusions in a curious sort of way. Now again, I could stop at this point, and I will do in four minutes and 58 seconds, <laughs> because my main contention might have been illustrated, that is the RAF didn't have a coherent view of education and how and why training was different. Now while there was a general endorsement of the need for training, there was nothing resembling a consistent approach to education as something integral to the Air Force's ability to articulate its contribution to the national interest broadly understood and to the nation's strategic needs in a time of contested outlooks and, indeed, at a time in which people were worried about the financial outlays. Very often it's a case when the economy contracts, the first place that the Treasurer will look is to cut defence spending. Now, I've not canvassed changing views within the Air Force over the last three decades because I'm still looking around for a, a, a substantive statement of vision of education, academic education, since 1980 that would dislodge my general impression, impression of the place of education in the RAF. I still think it's strongly vocational and largely influenced by technology management. That's fine. I'm not criticising that. It's the opportunity cost that part of that represents. And the opportunity cost is this. Unlike the Army, the RAF has produced very few public intellectuals, only a handful of officers write for publication. Now, I can't remember, Trav, whether you said don't, won't or can't write this morning. And also, it seems to me, uh, the RAF has, or we've had a great deal of traf a, a difficulty attracting RAF personnel to conferences. Why? Because they're all so busy. Well, if you want to sustain an argument that the RAF is busier than the Army, um, see me afterwards and we will give that all the publicity and profile you want. It seems to me though, again in contradistinction to the Army, the Army invests in what the Army values. The Army says that education is important, the Army invests in it. Look at the number of public intellectuals and commentators the Army has produced in contrast to the Air Force, I'd say it's probably one to ten. Um, there are not too many people like my friend Mark O'Neill with a PhD in counterinsurgency who comments on a whole range of things and the Chief actually encourages all of this to create a culture whereby people think thoughts. Now, yes, it will change with the Chief. This current Chief says, I think let a thousand flowers bloom and we'll chop down a few of the weeds. Uh, but I'm not seeing perhaps that in the other two services. Not that people are afraid to speak, but I think there's an element of that uh, I think it's more the case that people are self-conscious, if not lacking in confidence, in speaking of uh, their view of air power, its place in the national life, uh, the way that they might perhaps or ought if they'd given them an education which might have provided a broader base upon which to speak. Now, I want to stop at that point and simply say that it's a case of emphasis. How do you switch emphasis? There's a great deal of ways of doing that. One of them is, for instance, when the chief talks about, the current chief talks about his five distinct vectors for Air Force's 10-year strategy, and when he talks about them, and particularly people and communications, in terms that are technology enabled and training supported, but makes no mention of a broad-based liberal and balanced education, you could say, well, if he'd actually said that that had profile, then perhaps it might have attracted people to it, and be more enthusiastic about it. But when he spoke about people and communication, it was in terms, of in terms of training. And when people talk about professional military education, they're really talking about training. And I would be hopeful, as at least our university in defence is coming up to its 50 years of interaction, that if I can persuade enough senior people in defence to say, we've come a long way in 50 years, where will we go in the next 50 years? I think for us as the university, that milestone of half a century is a good time for that discussion uh, to happen. Uh, I have to say I stand in awe of the people that I've heard today who've been educated and trained by the Air Force. It's not the case of there isn't anyone, it's a case of I think letting more of those flowers bloom and us smelling the perfume. I'm now happy to take your questions, comments and complaints. Thank you very much, Tom. I think there's about 20 seconds to go. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, please. Thank you, Tom. Um, 
agree 100%, uh, especially on the... Oh, sorry, I introduce yes. myself again. Scotland Murray Ivanovich again. You um, agree with me 100%. Uh, I agree with you 100% on the fact that uh, universities don't teach people to think. Uh, it's been one of my bugbears forever. Um, I would like to get your views on what I consider to be a cultural problem, though. Uh, because, and I'll, I'll bring in the ubiquitous joke, how do you get a, a, a philosophy PhD off your front doorstep, pay for the pizza. Um, culturally, we value uh, education almost universally as a vocational pursuit. So it's not really, it's, how, how can it be any different in, uh, um, in the Air Force? So what are your thoughts on that, the cultural issue? Well, but Air Force is better placed because it is a culture within a culture. To be a different culture, that would seem to me. I think there was a window of time, and I think I was fortunate in the Navy at least, when there was that culture, when people were sent off to do honours degrees. And I was encouraged to do a PhD, which is I did. And then when I did it on the Voyager disaster, they said, oh, gee, thanks. Um, but there was a period of time, a mood, a mood maybe, where the chief, who didn't have a degree and had no interest in getting a degree, I'm talking about Vice Admiral Mike Hudson, his view kind of was, yeah, but Tom, but, you know, I wasn't of that generation. You are. Let's give you opportunities. Let's have people thinking and talking. So Rear Admiral James Goldrick, uh, Peter Jones, uh, we were the three consecutive speechwriters to the chief. And his view was that, you know, let's create a place where we've got people thinking ideas. Um, let's give... Because I think if you're not given the chance to express an idea, your brain does atrophy. Or if you're worried about coming up with a discordant view, I think also people won't kind of think as, as they ought. And the university, I take the view at this place, is that our idea here, and it was Arthur Tang's phrase, broadening minds. Arthur said, we need a place to broaden minds. Um, his idea, feeling was that it was far too narrow thinking. And he was talking about the senior officers with which he was dealing after Vietnam, who had no vision for what defence and the ADF might look like in that period. Right down to... Um, no, I won't say who it was, but one particular very senior officer, Frank Hassett, um, <laughs> that, that, that he just frustrated Arthur just intensely because he always thought as an army person and went through an army tactical appreciation type model of things and he was looking for something completely out of the box. And it's interesting, he said, oh, why don't we have philosophy, he said this at a COSC meeting, why don't we have philosophy at the new academy? And it was like he'd, he'd had added some blasphemy. They all said, why would you do that? And he said, well, it helps people to think. It might help them to ask the right question, said Arthur. Now, the trouble is, if you say, well, with training, we can map that against competence and employment. When it comes to educated people, I'm giving an educated person who perhaps then is not so much about answering the question, but worked out the right question. And it's argued that if education takes you when you're tra where your training stops, that's another virtue of it. But I also think, I can't remember who it was, um, it might have been General Dunstan, I think, something like, that education actually is integral to character. Character is integral to leadership, and without those things, we're not going to have the kind of leaders that we want. So I would think in Air Force, you could say, well, look, you know, we know that's the undifferentiated community, but we do shape up our own community. It can be different to the other two services, and the place perhaps, the, the, the time perhaps to start is now. So giving people at the, you know, kind of um, wing commander level a chance to write, to think, and to publish, because, see, my point, Trav, is if you don't write, then no one's going to read it. So more people will read what you said today than heard it. And if it's going to stand up and have legs and walk, put it in a publication, put it out there and see what happens to it. Um, you know, anyone can do a PhD. It'll be read by four people. One of them's your mum and she's lying. <laughs> so I found, for me at least, and you start, we start by thinking, you're absolutely right, then we write... That's when we organise our thought, stand back from it, look at it, critique it, then we rewrite, then we might speak about it, then we rewrite. It's that kind of evolving process. Now, I know you can write, and I hope, I'm not going to trap you, and I hope that you write more, because Air Force people just, was it don't or won't? Both. Right. <laughs> Whereas Army people, they're pumping this stuff out. And I think that... Um, in the popular mind, army is what people think of. They talk about, don't talk about, you know, ADF person, talk about diggers. And what do the diggers think? I don't know, I don't meet many diggers myself. But there we go. Next question, perhaps. Mark. Have, sorry, we'll, we'll, one back here and then Travis, thank you. 
Now, in terms of public, I'm going to embarrass him. See, when I thought about who could we get to give a broad-ranging critique of today, there weren't that many people, but my friend Mark Lax came to mind, because there's not many like you, are there, Mark? Tom, 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 we need to talk. <laughs> now, my disclaimer is I have a science degree with a major in physics, actually. <laughs> but, but my question relates to the fact that the Academy died in 1986. That was over 30 years ago. Has ADFA performed any better? Uh, well, OK, two measures, um, two measures. Uh, one of them is um, the academic results of cadets, and the second measure is retention. Now, again, I only speak from Navy. Navy wanted this place, or the Chief did, for two reasons. One, because the attrition rate of my class was so great, and the second thing was we had 51% syndrome. When this place started, guess what we had? Both of those things were bad, like really bad. So in the early 90s, retention was bad, 51% was rampant. Um, if we move forward to the last few years, we have a higher uh, result per student here than at Kensington. So the students here are performing better than they are at Kensington. And the second thing is retention rates gone up like that. So if only on those two things, Mark. Now, I'm not defending, because the, the academy model is not the university's doing. It's just the partner. It's the academic partner. But if we set on those two things, and come back to me and argue with me, um, that I think if the academic standards of cadets are higher than at Kensington, that's an argument for, well, just send them out to wherever. And if the retention's gone up, now you might say, well, it's not got anything to do with here. I think it has. I was here in the early 90s doing my PhD. I thought this was a ghastly place, to be honest. I thought it was brutal, and all of those things that came out later were going on, and I saw, observed some of them. But I do think, since I've been back here three years, it's a different, different kind of a place. So has the academy model worked all together? Um, it, again, depends on the metrics. If we did it differently, how do you think we should do it? Well, I just challenge the fact, is it the academy, or is it the quality of the entrants and their cultural background and their Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Alpha type of stuff. Because I teach at the staff college. Now, they're the majors, the sort of leaders, the lieutenant commanders of the future. They are now, but they will be the future. And it seems to me that, and I've been doing it for about four or five years, four or five years ago, I wouldn't have fed any single one of those Australian students. This course this year are excellent. All Did I hear you say what I thought you said? <laughs> All of them have come through the process the academies. And so it's not necessarily the academy's training, education, and structured learning programs. It's as much about the quality of the individual as it is about their very early university education, which then should set them up for their future office of development. Yeah, I mean, I would say on behalf of the university, we don't choose them, we just educate them. So there's lots of ways in which you can do it, lots of ways other people do do it. Are we attracting a different kind of person now to join the RAAF as an officer? Are we attracting a different kind of person? Um, that's not why of expertise don't know. Um, and I'm not so much defending the academy as talking about foregrounding education. Now, I have to say, and, and I can't say all good things about the army because that wouldn't be right, um, is that uh, I, I said to the Chief of Army, I think late last year though, is that for instance the quality of written prose in Army was getting really turgid, stilted, you know, showing all the signs of reportees. And I said, look, if I'm going to produce a book like these, which I want to go primarily to members of the public to get them engaged in the conversation, you have to write in, and I was at Kensington when Donald Horne uh, was kind of roaming the halls, they wrote The Lucky Country, and he talked about writing public prose. Uh, and I think it's that in Army, and Mark and I have had a yarn about this, about people writing in public prose. So when we have a conference like this, and people have talked in public prose today, I mean, there's been some jargon, but um, that seems to me to be, a, to be a sign that people have got a, that education will help you to take complex matters and make them straightforward in explanation. But in Army, it's just this kind of, this third person, it can be said. By whom? Are you saying it? <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, and I, the chief said to me, well, Tom, he said, I've noted this, and I'm trying to get people now to write me letters. You know, I think I did that kind of thing. So if our prose is, in Army at least, if the prose is getting stilted, it's also going to backfeed, I think, up into the, into the thinking. But again, if your audience is only ever your boss, 
or a memo for inside your division, you're never going to actually write stuff that's worth reading. And if you go away today with nothing, read George Orwell's On the Politics of English Language, written in 1932. If you've not read that, read it. Beautiful bit of writing, but it would stomp on half of the reading that I, stuff that I see coming out of uh, uh, coming out of Russell. The other thing I'd say just briefly is that um, we have the John Howard collection. All Mr. Howard's official papers are coming in, and some of his ministers, um, you know, no names, no pack drill. Um, the writing is terrible. Now it's because they never wrote when they were in public life. Somebody wrote it for them. Now they have to write it, and guess what? The emperor may have no clothes. Uh, Mark, last one. Uh, no, I'm oh, sorry. We've been cut off. Yes, we're at belly. <laughs> um, readers, uh, readers, farewell. We'll be. Uh... <laughs>